All right, so what we're going to do in this particular lesson is take a step back from writing code for a second. I want to talk about object-oriented programming, why you should write object-oriented code. Now, if you recall, way back at the beginning of the course, I talked about how there were different types of programming. There was functional programming, which is procedural programming, and there's another type of programming called object-oriented programming. Now, we've been learning the basics of object-oriented programming in the last several lessons. And uh, so let's just go over a few reasons why you want to consider using object-oriented programming. By the way, most programming these days is object-oriented. It's in that style where you write your objects, you write your classes, and you create objects from your classes, and so on. Whether it be Python, C Sharp, Java, PHP, Ruby, these are all object-oriented languages. So it's very good to know, and uh, just for that reason alone, right? So that you can jump from one language to the next. But Python, like some other languages, also have a non-object-oriented way in which you can write the code. You can write Python code that is functions-based functional code. Anyway, so why use object-oriented Python, or as some nerds would say, OO Python? Number one, code reuse. The idea, one of the principal ideas behind object-oriented programming is that you're going to write code that's reusable. So you create your classes, and then you'll be able to use these classes over and over again in, in different parts of your app, so you don't have to write it over and over again. And if you're really good at it, meaning if you write really good objects or really good classes, you'll be able to use your code in different apps, in different programs. And you see this where, if you recall, we were using modules like the random module and like uh, the TK inter module where, where we were reusing objects from these modules to uh, to do stuff. Another reason that people like object-oriented code is that object-oriented code by its very nature is modular. It's code that allows you to create modules where you can move these modules around. The modules are the classes, of course, right? Again, having modular code makes it more reusable or it's easier to reuse. It's also easier to maintain if it's done properly, meaning that if you, for instance, create an automobile class and you have all your code inside your automobile class and a whole bunch of methods, remember, methods are just functions that exist inside of classes, it's easier to sort of go back and update your automobile class depending on what happens in your app. Your app will change, you may have different requirements come up, requirement, you know, maybe you're writing a game and you have to add new levels or new capabilities to your automobile class, it's a lot easier to maintain and to go back to it when you just have to go to that one class and make the changes. Another advantage of object-oriented code is that it is extendable, meaning if you, for instance, have, again, that automobile class that you created, perhaps you you find out that automobiles have different capabilities. Maybe you're, you're writing a video game and you have a video game a racing game, you decide that you're going to add rockets to your cars in the video game. So you can add rocket capabilities to the automobile class. And it's a lot easier to do it that way many times versus old school procedural methods. Another big advantage of object-oriented code is that it helps you to better plan out your programs, plan out your apps, because you can divide your code into these logical, smaller chunks of code these are the classes, of course. Now, what do I mean by logical? You remember when we were creating uh, some of our classes, our simple classes in, in the game, for instance, we could put our code related to a particular thing that we want to do, and it's kind of logical. So, for example, let's say we had a shopping cart website, kind of like an Amazon, and people are adding items to the cart. You could create an, an object called shopping cart, and in that shopping cart object, you could have a bunch of methods that will allow you to add item to the cart, to remove item from the cart, calculate total spent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So inside of this shopping cart object, you could have all the things that a shopping cart would do. So it's a logical 
grouping of code inside of this object, if that makes any sense. By the way, I'm interchanging class with object. As you know, a class is the blueprint and they become objects when you're running your code. But anyway, and finally, another advantage of object-oriented code is that it can be much more readable if, again, you write the code properly. So there you go. In a nutshell, those are the advantages of object-oriented coding. There is some debate out there in the nerd world, but generally speaking, object-oriented programming these days is still by far and away the most popular style of programming. In my experience as a nerd, I would keep my object-oriented code very simple. Again, the oldest rule of programming is keep your code simple. And object-oriented programming could get very, very complex and can get very, very messy and convoluted if you let it. Just keep that in mind as you go forward, as you learn to become a more advanced programmer. Hey guys, you're watching lessons from my beginner's Python course where I teach you everything you need to know about Python to get up and running as a developer. This is the object-oriented programming section. Of course, with the full Studio Web version of this course, you get all the quizzing and the hinting and the interactivity and the tracking. The videos alone are, people love them. But when you add all that extra stuff, it just supercharges and speeds up your learning process. All right, have fun. All right, now it's time to jump back into code. We're going to take a, a closer look at objects and classes. And the goal of the next few lessons is to teach you inheritance and a few other things about object-oriented programming we have not seen before. So let's start off at the top of the page here. I put down a few comments here, some Python conventions. Now, you remember PEP8 that we looked at in previous videos. So this is uh, some selected peps, if you will, from that, uh, from that page this is the official Python guide. So let's go over a few things. First of all, number one, class names should normally use cap words convention. For instance, here's a class and uh, yeah, here's the convention, auto, mobile, caps words, right? Just like that. Yeah, yeah. I have another class here, truck. Actually, you know what? It should be like that. That's better. Truck. So, uh, number two. Function names should be lowercase with words separated by underscores as necessary to improve readability. So, you know that functions are called methods when created inside of classes. So, this rule number two applies to methods as well. So, here's one. Turn underscore off, right? So, you know, separated by underscore. So why do we have conventions in our code? Because it makes the code more readable. So now when somebody sees this automobile, they know it's a class because it starts with a capital and it has this cap words convention. That's all. It just makes the code easier to read. Number three, always use self for the first argument in instance methods. All right. What the heck is an instance method? So let's just... Um, look at a method, which is a function inside of a class. I won't say that again. We should know that by now. And you notice I've added the argument self. We've talked about this before. You always have to add self. Here's self. Now, if I had multiple arguments, you know, I could have other arguments here. It could be name, uh, whatever. If I had second and third arguments and fourth arguments, whatever. If I had more arguments than, than just self, you'd always put self first. That's the whole point of it. Just make sure you always have self first. And you know, that's a self-referencing variable that we have to have in our methods. Finally, multi-line comments should use the number symbol for each line. Don't use doc string. I cheated before. Remember before when I was doing multi-line comments, I would use the doc string and I would uh, do something like this. Well, you shouldn't do that. For multi-line comments, like I did here, we use, well, I use the number symbol. All right, so that's enough with that. So let's jump into the code. So I want you to write out this code that you see here. So I'm going to pause. You're going to pause the video in three, two, one. Pause the video. Okay. Did you write out the code? I hope you wrote out the code. It's very important that you write code. It helps you to understand. So I assume that you wrote the code. So anyway, so we have our first class here, automobile. 
We've seen all this before. We have a class variable. Oh, I forgot to mention instance method. That's a method inside of a class, that's all. Because when you create an object from a class, remember we did that before and we're gonna do that very soon. One way of calling that, when you create an object, let me just put a comment here. Creating an object from a class nerds call creating an instance. There you go, that's why. So when you're talking about instance, instance methods, they're just talking about methods you know, being called inside of a class when you create the object. I hope that makes sense. So yeah, so we got that. I'll save that. And uh, so you've written this class out. So we have our first class. We have a couple of functions here. Well, methods. Start, turn off. And you see we have another class, truck. Now, the first class is called automobile. The second class is called truck. You notice in the second class, we added a little... Uh, the brackets here, and we added automobile. What's going on here? Now, class automobile, this should give you a hint, class automobile. So basically what we're doing with this code here is we're telling Python that the class truck is inheriting from class automobile. Inheriting, think about when your, your great-grandmother dies and she leaves you um, her sewing kit and you inherit the sewing kit and 50 bucks, that's your inheritance. You're getting something from grandma. So when a class, when the class truck is inheriting from automobile, and we know it's inheriting from automobile because we put in here, it's automobile inside these uh, parentheses. When truck is inheriting from automobile, it is essentially inheriting all the code found inside of automobile. Now, if you remember in the previous video, I said that uh, one of the purposes of object-oriented programming was to reuse code. So watch what happens. So I'm gonna instantiate a new truck. So I'm gonna say my truck, my truck equals truck. Pretty simple, so we created a truck, right? Now watch this, I'm gonna go my truck dot mm, start. Now here's something interesting about this code. If you notice the truck class, we created a truck object. This is the truck object the handle. It's from the truck class. And you notice we're calling the start method inside of the truck class. We didn't define the start method. There's no start method. But ah, in the parent class, the parent of truck, remember truck inherited all kinds of code from automobile. In the parent, you see, but we do indeed have a start method. So let's see what happens. I save that. Let's get this out of the way here. And uh, let's run that F5. Look at that. Now, even though inside of the truck class, and we created our object from the truck class, we did that right here, we instantiated the object, uh, you notice that there is no start method. Because class truck inherited from class automobile, class truck automatically gets all the code inside of automobile. So therefore, class truck does have the start method, even though we didn't declare it inside of class truck because it got it from automobile. So when we called the start method, Python knew what to do because it said, oh, you're creating a truck object, right? Truck object. And we're saying truck.start says it. So Python went, hmm. There's no start method up, oh, but it's a subclass it inherited from automobile. That means you should check in here. Oh, here it is, here's start. And look at that, automobile starting vroom vroom, automobile starting vroom vroom. Much more to come, so write out this code. So the next object-oriented concept we're gonna learn is something called overriding. So let's take a look at an example of what we're talking about here. So we've seen this code before. And we know that here, when I created my truck object, I called the start method. And because we did not define or create the start method in our truck class, Python was smart enough to know that we could use the automobile class start method because truck was a subclass, or some people would say a child class, of automobile. 
And this is all part of inheritance. And inheritance is all about code reuse, so that we don't duplicate our code, amongst other things. So the problem we have here, though, if we looked, so we started our truck, and then when we called the start method, you notice right here, it said automobile is starting. Vroom, vroom. Now the problem with that, that's kind of generic, right? An automobile could be a truck, it could be a sports car, it could be a minivan, so many different types of automobiles. Now the problem with this generic start method, generic means it applies to everybody, it could be any car, it doesn't tell you anything about the particular car or the particular automobile rather that, uh, that we're using, right, at the time when the program is running. So what do we do? Well, we can do something called overriding a method. Now, method overriding is basically creating a copy of a method that we have in our base class. In this case, this is automobiles, our base class. And we create a new version of that method. I'm just going to do it right here. Boom. And get this comment in place here. So I put a comment overriding method. So you see, I've defined a start method inside of the class truck. And uh, even though we have a start method here, so this start method says truck is starting, put a, put a, put a room. So it's a little bit different from when an automobile, the generic automobile starts. Let's run this code. I'm going to save it, F5. Truck is starting, put a, put a, put a room. So again, because we created a start method inside of our truck class, Python is smart enough to know that we wanted to use the trucks start method because this object truck, right? We created this object by instantiating the truck class. This little review classes are blueprints for objects. So to create an actual object, a Python object, in this case, from a class, you have to use this code here. This is called object instantiation, object creation. So what you should do is pause the video and you should write out this code and uh, so that you override the start method in your truck class. Ready? Three, two, one. Pause the video. All right, I'm back. Uh, hopefully you wrote out your own definition and you've overridden the start method of the base class automobile. I'm using the nerd terms, by the way, because I want you to get used to it. So the next thing you got to do is I want you to override the turn off method inside of the truck class. And uh, instead of printing click, put, 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 put vehicles off, you might say uh, click, uh, I don't know, put a, put a, put a, the truck is off, something like that. Get ready to pause the video, override the turn off method inside of the truck class. Ready? Three, two, one, go. All right, if you haven't done it already, let's do it. Remember I told you a long time ago, one of the best things uh, in programming is cut and paste, saves you mistakes. So let's go four clicks on the spacebar. One, two, three, four. Remember, Python, we gotta keep our code lined up. Def turn off, shut off. I'll just change the doc string here. This is the doc string. Click, click, I don't know. Put a, put a, be a truck is off. Now, if you were building a real app, real program, you wouldn't just be printing out text. You might have the truck, if it's a video game or if it's a real truck, you might have to trigger different things that you don't have triggered in your generic automobile class. Save that. Now let's run the code. F5, truck is off. Again, Python was smart enough to know when we're calling turn off, it used the turn off function or method rather built into the truck class. Prove a point. Let me just do this. Bam, bam, bam. Save that. F5 again. And here we go. Because this is the turn off call right here. Because we did not define turn off in our truck class, 
And because truck is a subclass of automobile, it's Python smart enough to know when we call turn off here. By the way, just to remind you, when I say call, you mean calling a method, calling a function. That's what nerds say. And what they mean is using a method. Think of it like you're calling up somebody. Hey, uh, send me a pizza. Hey, turn off the car. Hey, start the... You get the idea. Anyway, because Python's smart enough, it knows, ah, we're calling the turn off method because turn off, we commented it out so Python doesn't see it. Remember, comments are skipped. Any code commented out, Python will skip. And you see right here, it uses the generic turn off method. Vehicle, put, 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 vehicles off, put, 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 vehicles off. Fantastic. You learned a new thing. All right. In this lesson, we're going to do some, um, yeah, we're going to get down deep into some nerd stuff here. I'm going to open up the file. Sometimes when you're doing some object oriented coding, sometimes other coders, other programmers will want to get information about your, your classes. So how do we do that? Well, let me show you something. It's going to freak you out. So we're going to print and we're just going to say print my underscore truck. Bear with me. Let me just uh, comment these out right now. What this command is doing. Well, let me just save this F5 run it. All right. I got everything in place. So this command here, well, this call to the print function, look what it does here. This is the result. It says truck object at blah, 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 blah. So it's saying main, this is the main Python program. So it says inside the main Python program, we have a truck object, right? Remember my truck, which we instantiated here from the truck class. So we have a truck object at 0x1003e, anyway, this is a memory address, as in memory RAM in your computer. Eh, not too important. All you need to know is that when we do print on the my truck object, which we instantiated, means we created the truck object, well, the my truck object, from the class truck, which we defined up here. Yeah, we all know this. We're pretty good now. So we say print my truck, Python says, okay, we'll print you information about the truck object. This isn't very user friendly. It doesn't tell us much, right? But what we're going to do, we're going to learn about one of those special methods built into Python that will allow us to uh, add a little bit more information about our truck. So I'm going to go into the truck class. And let me just cut and paste. So you remember when we used the init function and we had, uh, so now we're going to be using something called the uh, str, which is short for string. Now we know this is a special built in method built in to Python. And we know that because we've got our double underscores here. So what this does, this allows us to override the default behavior of our class. This is something built into Python globally, affects all classes. That's what these special methods are and special methods, like we said, init and so on. So we got the double underscore tells us this is a special method or you can say a special function. One thing you should know before we go on with this is that Python has a lot of built in special functions or special methods like str, like init, etc. So, so we define def special function string. And we say return 2019 vehicle sold by Studio Web. So 2019, we'll say not vehicle, say truck, right? Because it's a truck. So year 2019 truck sold by Studio Web. So what happens now? So let me save that. Again, everything else is the same. We're just going to print my truck. Let's run the code F5. Bam! So here's another example of using our nerd knowledge of overriding methods where we can tell Python how exactly to present our class. So by default, when you don't have the uh, string function or method defined by Python will present this to us, but we as master nerds know that we can override 
methods built into any class and we can tell it what to do. In these situations, remember these are return statements, the function returns a value. Now in these examples, because I'm just teaching you the basic concepts and so on, we're doing simple things. We're just printing out text. Now you could do all kinds of things. You can launch a window, you can send an email, you can uh, go visit a web page and grab the text. You can do whatever you want. You can take an input. It's all up to you what you want to do. Python gives you the ability to set default values for methods and functions. Remember, one last time, a method is just a function inside of a class. So uh, let's scroll down here. I'll just show you by example because that's just the easiest way to approach it. So first of all, we have our base class or our parent class, automobile. We see our class truck inherits from automobile. Although to be honest with you, the way we have our class set up now, we haven't utilized any of these uh, built-in methods. We, well, at least we didn't call them here. Now we can call them as we know, meaning we could we could go, you know, my truck dot start and turn off, and it would work because truck is a subclass of automobile. I'm just explaining this over and over again, so hopefully the terminology class, subclass, parent class, child class, those terms, those nerd words will start to be will start to stick in your mind. Anyway, so let's look at the point of this. Now here I want to teach you how to add default values to your methods. We've seen our init special method before. We know it's a special method because it opens up with two underscores and closes with two underscores. Def init. We also have the def string just for uh, sake of completion. These are two special methods or two special functions. And we know all about those. So here's what we want to look at for this particular video. You see we have the parameter year and we set it equals to none. None is one of those keywords in Python and it has a special meaning. It means none. And what does none mean? It's nothing. It's not zero. It's not one. It's not a, it's not a text string. It's none. Anyhow, so this is what you have in Python. You got year equals none, and this allows us to create default values in our method. So this is how it works. So you go if year, mm -hmm. if year is none, if it's indeed, meaning when somebody created the truck class or an object from the truck class, they didn't put any value, any argument in the creation. We'll see what that means in a second. Then we say self.year equals 2018, else self.year is equal to year. So let's see how this works. So here I've created a truck object based on my truck class. And you see, I fed it a value. I said, it's year, it's year, it's 2021. So let me say that, F5, run it. The truck was built in 2021. Fair enough, right? Pretty good, pretty good. No big deal. So let's now specify a new truck and then a truck. I'm not going to specify the year. I'm going to just call it another truck. So we go another truck, save that. So we are instantiating a, another object based on the truck class. This is object instantiation. You can save it another truck, this variable is a type of truck. And that is in reference to object types. Remember we had int, string. So by creating a class called truck, we've created a new data type. It's a truck data type. So we'll see how this works in a second. Anyway, so we go another truck, it was a truck, another truck, dot truck here. Now I notice I didn't specify what year this truck was made as I did up here. So we'll see what happens, uh, F12, Ah, see, the second truck, this one right here, built in 2018. Why? Because we didn't put a value, so that's none. So if year is none, equals 2018. So, so there you go. We just learned how to use or set up default values in our methods. Sometimes that makes sense for certain types of apps you're going to be building, certain types of programs. Default values in methods can come in handy. Okay. So what I want to do now is we're going to see if you 
can create your own method with a default value. Remember, this is the default value here. So uh, we're going to structure the new method just like this. But I want you to call the method dump load. So what you're going to do when the dump load method is called in one situation where a value is provided, I want you to write the text trunk is dumping and then add that value. That will be a value from the parameters or actually from the method argument. And in the situation where they don't add a value, I want the default text to read truck has nothing to dump. All right, so let me say that again. In this method, it's going to be called dump load. When somebody does not enter in a value, just have Python print out truck has nothing to dump. On the other hand, if they do provide a value, have Python print truck is dumping and then include whatever value they add. Now, this is, would be a, uh, a string, of course. All right. Get ready to write the method. Three, two, one, go. Pause the video. So um, I assume that you've done it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just add it in myself. Let's put it right here. Of course, uh, I already did it. So here it is. Pretty simple. So def dump load value none so if value is none truck has nothing to dump else print truck uh, is dumping plus value we've seen this type of thing before so now let's um let's uh let's add this in like this so one time we call dump load we don't provide a value the other time we do let's save this file let's run the code see what happens here we go so yeah truck has nothing to dump Right, truck has nothing to dump because we didn't put a value. Truck is dumping. Boom, boom, boom. I provided a value here. Now, one last check. We're going to just put in a number in the argument. So it's just a number, an integer. Now, I want you to change the dump load function, excuse me, method. I want you to change the dump load method. Small little change you have to add to it to make sure that we don't get an error. Because if we run it now, watch what happens. Oh, the error is type error must be string, not int. That's the hint. This is on line 36. And uh, this is line 35. This is line 36. So on line 36, it says there's an error, a type error, an error that has to do with data types, type error. So what do you need to do? Ready? Three, two, one. Pause the video. Do the change. Okay, I assume you made the change. I'm going to do it. All you have to do is type in str, bang, bang. That str function, as we know, will convert whatever value this is into a string. Let's F5 again. Run the code. Blam. It works. To end off, let's just do something really quick here. So I am using the type function built into Python to determine what type of object or what type of data is being held by the variable another truck. And I'm just printing out the results. So just save that. And here it is, class main truck. So it says it's a class. It's inside of main and it's a truck class truck class yeah some nerd stuff all right so what we're going to do in this lesson is look at how we can use our own modules well create our own modules to be able to separate out our python code our python program into logical components why would you want to do that well, the number one rule of programming is to have simple code. So by separating out your code into separate PY files, as you see that I've done here, that simplifies the code. By having separate PY files, you can say, hey, Tanya, programmer, you uh, work on this one, and then Tiffany, another programmer, work on this one. 
and Steph Programmer will work on this one. So this way, if you have bigger, complex apps, let's say you're creating a game or a system to uh, do shopping carts, whatever, if the app is more complex, it's smart to organize your app, first of all, into modules. And then you can assign module work to individual coders. And even if you are working alone, having your code in different modules makes sense. Now, this is a very, very simple program that we're building here. And the whole point of this is just to show you how to work it all together. So first of all, I have module one and module two. Now, if this was a video game, I might have module on alien ships, and then I have another module on human ships or something like that, right? And we have here something called the module runner. Now, these names, you can, you can give these Python files as PY files, any name you like, it's up to you. I just did this for the sake of our little video here. So module runner, I call it that because literally this code here is running these modules. So here we go. Here's module runner opened up. Top, I have the, uh, the Python comments here. So what I've done, first of all, is I've imported three modules. Module one, comma, module two, comma. So these are our modules, module one, module two, right? And you notice this file here, module runner, is sitting beside these two, so it knows where to find these two modules. So if you have module runner in some subdirectory, you have to make sure these two modules are beside each other. Otherwise, your code gets a little bit more complex. So just do that for now. What I want you to do, though, is pause this video now and create three PY files that are empty. And you could, if you want, add comments at the top. Program controller Python file, which is module underscore runner. Then you have module underscore two, module underscore uh, one. So anyway, we're going to go over all this code in a second. So first of all, pause, create these three files, and create module runner and add this line and add this line. Okay, I hope you've done that now. So we've imported module one, module two, our own modules, and I've imported the time module, which we've seen before. So the first thing I do is just add a print command, a print function. Three modules have been imported. This will, of course, appear in the Python console. And this is just a way for our program to just unroll. So first of all, let's look at this one. Calling functions directly from a module. Got the comment here. And uh, so what I do, remember we imported module one. So I go inside of module one. This is the dot operator. Inside of module underscore one, run the function a underscore function. All right, that's pretty simple. So let's go to module one for the sake of argument. Here's module one. It's got a bunch of code in here. Let me just get into place so we can all see what's going on. Okay. So it says, so I'm saying module underscore one dot run a function. So we have a function right here. Very simple, a function. So then right afterwards, calling a function directly from module two. So it says in, in module two, so module underscore two dot another function, right? We imported module one, module two. Module two, of course, is this file here, module two. Let me just get it in place. See, I just have a function, another function. Pretty simple. Module two is extremely simple. So what you should do now is you should pause the video, open up module two, and write out this code since it's such a simple module. It just has one function, right? Def another function. Ready? Three, two, one, write the code. Okay, I assume you've written the code, so I'm going to shut down module two because it's pretty, uh, pretty simple. Make sure you get the names right, module underscore two dot py, right? So let me open up again, module one. That's where all the action is. So back to our module runner file, which basically runs all our code. I called from module two, the function, another function. Now what I've done here is I put time.sleep. Now what's that? That is the time module, which is built into Python. And I've called a sleep function and I set it to one second. So the way Python is running, it comes in and imports these two modules, then it prints this out, and then it runs this function for module one, module one, a function, and then it runs this function for module two. And then using the function sleep from inside the built-in Python time module, it sleeps, pauses for one second. If you put two, it would pause for two seconds. You understand, we've done this before. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back into module one, and you notice in module one, we besides having a function, we also have a proper class, class dog. 
And dog has three methods. Method one, method two, method three. So here we're going to be calling methods from within the module one module. So first of all, I want to instantiate an object from the dog class found in module one. So here's module one, right? And here is the dog class, right? So module one, module one. So I go, my dog, my underscore dog is equal to module underscore one dot dog. Now we know it's a class because it's capital D, capital D. We use capital D here because that's how I call the class. That's just a Python convention. We've learned about this before. So now that we got our dog object instantiated from the dog class found inside of module one, which is here, and we imported that with this. So now we can call the bark function, my dog dot bark, my dog class dog bark. And the bark function is very, very simple. It just says, prints the dog barks, blah, blah. So I wanted to do something a little bit more fun, you know. So in the next line, from module one, from our dog object right here, I call the function, or the method rather, dog underscore spawn window. Let's take a look at that. So uh, dog spawn window does something interesting. Now inside of module one, you notice I also imported other modules here. I imported turtle and TK inter. So these are two built-in packages with Python and they're for drawing and stuff. So let's just look at this code quickly. Dog spawn window. So I create a new TK inter object. Now interesting, see we're learning about modules and classes. So we know here we're looking inside the TK inter module and we're using the TK class. We know it's a class because it starts with capital T. So now we have our TK object, right? And then what we're also doing is we're using uh, inside our TK inter, again, we're using the button class, right? Remember, we did our work in objects. So one of the arguments for the but button class is you got to pass it a TK inter object, a TK object. So that's just the way it works. So you just put TK, you say technical click to draw, and then you, you say commands self, draw dog draw square so self means look inside of this class this class dog this is all part of class dog so look in, inside of our cells and find the function or the command remember a command is a function remember a function function is a method anyway dog underscore draw square dog underscore square so then this happens so what happens here using the turtle module we create a new pen object from turtle and we use a loop to draw our square so that's just the way it goes and at the end of this dog underscore draw underscore square function well method rather because it's inside a class we just call the print function to to write down that the dog has indeed finished drawing so there you go so that's uh seems pretty complex but you see how we're utilizing packages some built in, some some of our own, and organizing our code. Well, we'll just run the code for fun, see how it goes. So we're gonna function F5. Oh, I will save this. So look at, see it runs, module two. See, three modules have been poured, a function has been fired, module two. Remember module two, let me just open up that code. Uh, print, mod, when we call module two, it just writes out this text here, boom, boom, boom. The dog barks. Of course, let me shut that dog bark. We called the dog barking method. So now the last thing that fires off in our module is spawn window. Where's the window? Window spawns right here, just spawned. You see that button click to draw? That was created with the help of the TK inter object. We created our button, right? Click to draw, click to draw. Now when we click this button, it's going to run the command self draw dog draw square which is this right here and boom that's it and if you look in our window the dog has done its job drawing right the dog has done its job drawing which is uh right here boom there we go a lot to take in what you should do now is you should write out this code you should write out module one fill in all this I'll put it in view. So pause the video. Now write out module one. When you finish writing out module one, pause it. You've written out module two. 
And the next thing you do is you write your module runner. Pause the video, write this out. Okay, assume that you've written it out. So now you should have these three files, module one, module two, and module runner. So what happens here is this module runner runs these two other modules by calling them. I hope that makes sense. This is, uh, this is probably the longest video in the course, and it's taken us to being able to create actual apps where you have separate modules that do different things, and you control the code that comes in. You notice how in modules we can import other modules, whether it be built into Python, whether it be our own modules. We've learned how we can call functions directly from a module, or we can instantiate classes from a module. It's all very cool.